loving God, for He's the one who saves and gives life. Amen. Come on, church. Let's lift our voices to our God, and together we'll thirst no more. Come to the well that never is dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. That's Jesus. It's our Let's God. praise it. Come, all you sinners, come find His mercy. Come to the table, He will satisfy. Taste of His goodness, find what you're looking for. Of your love, our hearts are 
Jesus, you have saved us. We praise you, Jesus, for what you have done on the cross. We sing. Who, oh Lord, could save themselves? Their own soul could heal. Shame. Shame was deeper than the sea. Your grace is the dominion of darkness to his eternal light. Let's give God the praise that he deserves, church. Lord Jesus, to you all the glory and the praise. We worship you and we honor you this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Good morning, CCF. Why don't you greet your seatmate? Good morning. 
and tell them, I'm blessed that you're here. Why don't you also greet those who are watching us online? Say good morning. Okay, good morning to you. Now, if you're here for the first time, we'd like to welcome you and invite you at the Welcome Center located at the second floor. Uh, there will be prayer leaders and pastors there who'd like to welcome you, to pray for you, and to offer you some snacks and just to, for us to get to know you. Now, for some of our announcements today, we invite you okay, on April 23 to 24. This is the um, Matt Redman. Uh, it's a, he is the... We invite you on April 23 and 24 for special nights of training and worship with Grammy-winning songwriter and gifted worship leader Matt Redman. So to know more about this, let's watch this video. Matt Redman, live at the CCF Center. Hey everyone, it's Matt Redman here. I'm so excited to be coming to Manila. April 23rd and 24th, Christ Commission Fellowship. We would really love you to be there and join us. It's going to be a wonderful time. Be equipped on a night of training, April 23, 6 p.m. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. Express your praise to God on a night of worship, April 24, 6 p.m. Matt Redman, live at the CCF Center. Tickets available at ticketmax.ph. Matt Redman, live at the CCF. Matt Redman ticket booth in the main lobby. Uh, they are selling out fast, so get your tickets now. We also invite you to join this uh, life-changing retreat. It's our true life retreat entitled Transforming Love. This will be held on April 26 to 27 here at the CCF Center. Uh, learn more about God's transforming love and experience true life in Jesus Christ through our speakers, uh, Paul Devera, uh, Peter, uh, Pastor Peter Tanchi, Peter Tanchi, Pastor Leo Mata, Pastor Net Gochico, Pastor Ricky, Pastor Mike, Pastor Marty Okaya, and Pastor Bong Saking. Register at the link on the screen and you can scan the QR code or visit the True Life booth at the second floor lobby in front of the GLC booth. Uh, limited slots are available. Are are available, so register now. Now, can I ask everyone to please rise again as we read God's Word today in the book of Hosea. We will be reading Hosea chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 11, and chapter 14. Let's start with chapter 1, verse 1. The word of the Lord which came to Hosea, the son of Berai, during the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and during the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, when the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take to yourself a wife of harlotry, have children of harlotry, for the land commits flagrant harlotry forsaking the Lord. Verse 3, So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Biblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. Chapter 2, Say to your brothers, Ami, and to your sisters, Ruhamah, Contend with your mother, contend, for she is not my wife, and I am not her husband. Let her put her away her harlotry from her face, and her adultery from between her breasts. For or I will strip her naked, and expose her as on the day when she was born. I will also make her like a wilderness, make her like desert land, and lay her with thirst. Verse 5, For their mother was played the harlot, has played the harlot, she who conceived them has acted shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up, hedge up her with, with thorns and I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her paths. She will pursue her lovers, but she will not overtake them. And she will seek them, but will not find them. Then she will say, I will go back to my first husband. For it was better for me then than now. Verse 8, For she does not know that I, it was I who gave her the grain, the new wine and, and the oil, and the lavished her on silver and gold, which they used for Baal. Verse 19 and 20, 
I will betroth you to you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in loving kindness and in compassion. And I will betroth you to me in faithfulness. Then you will know the Lord. Chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. Then the Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by her husband, yet an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the Son of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love raisin cakes. So I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a half of barley. Then I said to her, you shall, you shall stay with me for many days. You shall not play the harlot, nor you shall have a man. So I will also be toward you. Verse 5, After, Afterward, the sons of Israel will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. And they will come trembling to the Lord and to his goodness in the last days. Chapter 11. When Israel was a youth, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. And the, and the more they called them, the more they went from them. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning incense to idols. Yet it is I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them in my arms. But they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of a man, with bonds of love. And I became to them a swan who lift the yoke from their jaws. And I bent down and fed them. Verse 8, how can I give you up, O Ephraim? Oh, how can I surrender you, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Sebuim? My heart is turned over within me. All my passions are kindled. Chapter 14, verse 1 to 2 and 9. Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, take away all iniquity and receive us graciously that we may present the fruit of our lips. Verse 9, whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right and the righteousness will walk in them, but the transgressors will stumble in them. Let's all pray. Our Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that indeed your ways are right. And that you indeed you want us to walk righteously in them. So we pray that you would use Pastor Peter. And that you would use this time for us to, to hear from you and to obey you and to honor you. We pray for your Holy Spirit to fill us, protect us from any distractions. And may it be all about you, Jesus, and your love for us. We worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Greater far than time or pain can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest end. The guilty pain.
Good morning, everybody. I miss you. <laughs> Praise God. We just arrived this week, and I want you to know God is doing a great work in Europe. We just finished training over 400 plus leaders of our members. And believe it or not, you can see my face here. And we have a lot of Believers who are excited to make disciples, to make disciples. Today, I'm excited to share with you our new series. Remember what's our new series? Alpha and Omega. It simply means the first and the last. We like you to know the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. They are one and the same. Tell your neighbor, God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Tell your neighbor. Now, have you heard of the following statement? When I read the Bible, it seems that God of the Old Testament is always angry, very judgmental, while the God of the New Testament seems to be very loving, seems to be kind. Have you heard of such discussion? Yes or no? Have you ever been bothered when you read the Old Testament about what God is doing? Yes or no? I want to teach you starting today, to have right theology. The God of the Old Testament is very loving. In fact, when you learn how to read the Bible, you will see his compassion. You will see his patience. The difference is this. The Old Testament are written from a perspective of longevity, meaning you can see the beginning, the middle, the end of the lives of people. How if they obey God, they are blessed. How if they don't obey God, there's going to be a problem. While the New Testament does not give you that perspective, it just gives you basic doctrine. Therefore, you need to learn how to read the Bible as one coordinated, one integrated book. Are you ready to learn? All right. I'm so excited because this is one of my favorite topics, the reality that God does not change. Pastor Ricky talk about Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. It talks about, the, for I, the Lord, do not change. Let me give you another verse in Psalm 91, Psalm 90, verse 1 and 2, about the unchanging immutability character of God. Let's read this together. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth and the world. Everybody read. Even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You see, God is different from us because God is not created. You and I are created. We have no concept of eternity. God is eternal. 
No one made him. If somebody is to make God, that argument tells you already, God is not God. God is God because He is eternal. The universe is not eternal. Scientists used to think the universe is eternal. No, no. Einstein and the latest scientist has already shown us there was a beginning. The universe, remember the Big Bang Theory? There was a beginning. But God has no beginning. Who made the universe? Answer, God. Now, do you know the name of God in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14 tells us He's unchanging? Some, Moses asked God, what is your name? How do I describe you? This is what God said in Exodus chapter 3, 14. Everybody read. God said to Moses, everybody. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Do you know the name of God? That's the word for Yahweh. I am that I am. Can you imagine if you ask somebody, what is your name, sir? I am. Again, what is your name? I am. You know what God is saying? I am the eternal one. That is the amazing thing about our God. However, when it comes to His love, I'd like you to know something. God, Jesus Christ, talks about Himself. Jesus said, the Bible tells us, Christ is the same yesterday, today, forever. So I want you to read this amazing quotation by Arthur Pink about the immutability, immutability of God. God cannot change. Everybody read this. He cannot change for the better. You know why he cannot change for the better? He's already perfect. And being perfect, he cannot change for the worse. Think about it. So you and I are always changing. I'm always learning. God does not learn because he knows everything. From day one, he knows everything. Think of an amazing God. Our God is eternal. He does not change. You can trust him completely. You can depend upon him completely. i like you to understand when we say God is unchanging, here are some of the things he does not change. Everybody read. Number one, God's character does not change. I see people, they change. Makes me sad. But God does not change. His character does not change. God's word does not change. He does not say, oh, I made a mistake. When he says something, that's it. God's purposes do not change. Think about it. God's promises do not change. I don't know about you. I claim God's promises. I have many promises I'm claiming from God, and I know it will happen. I change. He does not change. God's attitude towards sin does not change. And to me, this is such a comfort for everybody. Someday, God will judge sin. It is also scary because some people think God will not punish sin. No, God will judge sin for sure. So what's the lesson for you and for me? Understand God's love is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So today, I want to focus on one topic, the unfathomable love of God. Everybody read this together. The unfathomable love of God. Now, you may not know the meaning of the word unfathomable, but the word fathom is a measurement of the sea of the ocean. It is six feet. So when you say unfathomable, it's beyond measurement. It's beyond. So God's love is unfathomable. What do we mean? Well, I'm going to explain this to you. Example. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 3. I don't know if you can wrap this around your mind. The Lord appeared to him from afar. Everybody read, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with loving kindness. You notice something? The Bible tells us he's now speaking to the Israelites, referring to, guys, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with loving kindness. That word love, kesed, or chesed, is a beautiful word. It involves mercy. It involves grace. It involves promises. It's so hard 
to translate that into English. But what hit me, everlasting love means before you were born, God knows everything about you. And yet, He still loves you. Have you heard of such expression, if only I know, if only I know, if only I knew, I would not marry you? Have you heard of such statement? Yes or no? Yes or no? Kung alam ko lang. If I knew. But I don't know. Can I tell you something about God? Touches my heart. God knows everything about me. He knows my sinfulness. And He knows what I'm going to do also. And yet God says, I love you. Is that a comfort? Yes or no? So turn to your neighbor. Tell your neighbor, God loves you. It is incomprehensible how God can really love people, especially people like me. The more I walk with God, the more I see my own sinfulness. So, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 18, is a prayer of the Apostle Paul. And that's my prayer for you, and that should be our prayer for one another. You know what's his prayer? The Apostle Paul said that you and I will be able to comprehend with all the saints. So it's a prayer for everybody. What is the prayer? That you will be able to comprehend. The word comprehend, you will be able to grasp it. You will be able to fully understand this. It's like wrestling. That's the word for when you wrestle with somebody, you grab the person. Paul is saying, I pray that you will really be able to grab this truth. You'll be able to fully understand. What must you understand? What is the breadth, length, height, depth to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to all the fullness of God? You know what Paul is saying? That you will know the breath. God loves all of us. The width of God's love. That you'll be able to understand the length from eternity past, God loves you. For eternity future, He loves you. That you'll be able to know the height, the height of God's love. You cannot measure it. He loves you so much. Can you measure the height of heaven? Of course not. Can you measure the depth? God is saying no matter who you are, what you have done, how low you have sunk, I will still love you. That is the love of God. And Paul is saying, I am praying that your eyes will be open, that you will know the love of God. Can I tell you something? I find this probably the most important truth you will learn, that God really loves you and He loves me. Amen? And many times, we don't comprehend His love. And that's why we don't love Him back. Because you don't know how much He loves you. Because you think you are not worthy. Or you think because you grew up with a family that is dysfunctional, you have problems, you feel like, how can God love me with all of these problems? So my advice to you is open your heart today and listen to the Word of God. Many of our problems are caused by men because of our sinfulness. Your question will be, why will God allow these things to happen? And I'm going to tell you, you may not always know why God allows certain things to happen to you, including bad things. But at the end of the day, you must always believe God loves you and He has a good purpose for your life. Amen? All right, so example of those amazing reality, which I cannot even understand. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, the unfathomable love of God. Do you realize God chose us before the foundation of the world? God chose you before you were even born. He knows everything about you. He still chose you that we would be holy, blameless before Him in love. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself according to the kind intention of His will. The Bible tells us God chose you based on His intention. 
based on his own volition. Nobody ever forced God to choose you. Let me repeat. God chose you according to the kind intention of his will. He chose you before the foundation of the world, meaning he knows everything about you, and yet he still chose you. God predestined you, not because you deserve it, but he loves you. Amen? Having said that, I want us now to focus on the book of Hosea. You know, the book of Hosea can be confusing if you don't know how to read this. Hosea has 14 chapters. The first three chapters deals with Hosea's wayward life. God told Hosea what to do with this girl. It is a picture of God's love for you and for me. You will learn about this because the wife of Hosea was really problematic. And you will find out how can Hosea love a girl like Gomer? The second part of the book of Hosea has to do with, from chapter 4 to the end, it has to do with an example of the sinfulness, the idolatrous relationship of Israel with other gods, with other people. It's all about God's judgment, God's warning, because God warned Israel, judgment will come. I love you. You need to repent. So what is the theme of Hosea? Everybody read? God's love for his people. Now he uses the metaphor of between husband and wife. The Bible uses different metaphors to explain God's love for us. One of them is husband and wife. The other one is parents and children, father and children. The Bible wants you to know, to comprehend God's love, you need example. And I believe one of the reasons why God gave us families is for us to understand the love of God. The deepest love that can be described on planet Earth is the love of a husband and a wife. Think about it. Husband, wife, you have certain expectations. The two become one. Expectations of what? Faithfulness. Expectations of what? Loyalty. Expectations of what? Purity. And because of that relationship, it dawned upon me, when I do not follow God, when I do something wrong, it hurts. Not just me. It pains God. Because that relationship is the relationship of husband and wife. And the Bible described idolatry as spiritual adultery. So that term adultery in the Bible always referred to, if you read the Old Testament, is when the Israelites turn away from God and begin worshiping idols. Now, when I use the word idols, do not think of statues only. Do not think of man-made objects only. Just think of the book of Ezekiel, when Ezekiel said, you worship idols in your heart. Ah, so you begin to see the story of Hosea. God is saying, I love the people of Israel like a husband and a wife. The problem is this wife is awful. So I'm going to explain that to you. However, no matter how awful you are, I will still chase you. I still love you. But you see, you need to understand the pain of God. You know, I did not understand all of this until I became a father, until I became a husband. I realized when I do something wrong against my wife, it causes her pain. When my children does something wrong, I don't reject them, but I feel pain. Every time you disobey God, God is not rejecting you, but God tells you he is in pain because he loves you. That is the whole story of the book of Hosea. You will not know how to read this book if you don't see the big picture. It's about God's faithfulness toward us and our unfaithfulness towards him. So are you now ready to study the book of Hosea? All right, let's begin. 
The, I call this the unfathomable love of God. Point number one, it's undeserved. Say that with me. Undeserved. If you want to fathom the love of God, you have to understand God's love is undeserved. Let's read Hosea chapter 1, verse 1 and 2 together. The word of the Lord which came to Hosea, the son of Biri, during the days of Uzziah, Jodam, Ahaz, Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and during the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joas, king of Israel. Context. Hosea was the prophet sent by God to minister to the northern kingdom. He prophesied a long time, 60 years. Contemporaries, these are Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, Amos, Isaiah. These are his contemporaries. But Hosea focus on the northern kingdom. Now, when I say northern kingdom, you have to know what happened to Israel. In the time of David, Israel was one kingdom. In the time of Solomon, Israel was one kingdom. After Solomon died, the kingdom of Israel, as prophesied by God, was split. The northern kingdom, southern kingdom. The northern kingdom, the capital was in Samaria, started with King Jeroboam, etc., 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 until this other king, same name, Jeroboam II, same name, but this is the latter part of the nation of Israel. Listen, there is not one good king in the northern kingdom. All the kings are bad. The southern kingdom, they have many good kings. Are we together? So, Hosea was sent by God to prophesy where? Israel, northern kingdom kingdom. Are we clear? Now, to make his message effective, God tells Hosea to do something. The Lord first spoke through Hosea. The Lord said to Hosea, take to yourself wife of harlotry and have children of harlotry for the land commits fragrant harlotry forsaking the Lord. What in the world is God telling Hosea to do? God is saying, Hosea, I want you to marry somebody. I think Gomer must have been beautiful. Hosea must have been excited. But then God warned Hosea, someday this girl is going to commit adultery. Someday this girl is going to cause you a problem. Now, if you are Hosea, will you marry somebody like that? Be honest. Of course not. But God said to Hosea, you marry this girl. She will turn away from you, but you still marry her. Why? I discovered something. I discovered for a messenger of God to be effective, you got to feel the heart of God. God wanted Hosea to know that God's heart is broken. Because the people of Israel is so bad. It's like committing the sin of adultery. But Hosea will not know how it feels until he marries somebody who will go against being faithful. Understand? And I realize some people can just preach and talk. No heart. But God wants you to learn to feel what's going on in his heart. You want to be effective in counseling? Put yourself in the shoes of the people. That's what God told Hosea to do. So, let's continue reading. Look at verse 3. The Bible tells us, Hosea was obedient. He went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblin, and she conceived and bore him a son. Now, the Bible tells us, to save time, God told Gomer, the name of the children, not Gomer, Hosea. By the way, Hosea means what? Salvation. Gomer apparently is a girl that cannot control her sexual appetite. God told Hosea, now listen to me now. You put yourself in Hosea, you will have the following children, and God gave Hosea the name. So these are the names of Hosea's children. Number one is called Jezreel. Meaning, 
you will reap the consequences. There will be punishment. Jezreel means sowing and reaping. The next, this one is a boy, this one is a girl. The girl will be named No Pity. Can you imagine naming your daughter Walang Awa? I mean, and then the girl gave birth, Gomer gave birth to a third son, Lo Ami. Not my people. Apparently, this third child is from another man. Not mine. Now, these are all prophetic statements of what will happen to Israel. Israel is going to be dispersed. Israel is going to be judged. Israel is going to be no longer God's people. However, God also said, someday I'm going to restore you. So are we clear? So what is the first thing you need to know about the unfathomable love of God? It is undeserved. Say that with me. Undeserved. To prove to you, look at Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Please read. God demonstrates His own love toward us while we were sinners. Christ died for us. You notice something? Not when you became good that Christ died for you. Ah, uh -uh. The Bible says God's love is action. God demonstrated. Notice His own love. That's the love of God. Toward us while we were yet sinners. Up to now, I'm sure from time to time you sin. Yes or no? You think God knew? You think God knows? God knows my foolishness. God knows my sinfulness. You know why this is so important? I'd like you to know something. You don't have to play games with God. You don't have to hide. God knows. And yet God still loves you. But you need to know something. Every time you sin, it causes God pain. I never understood the seriousness of sin until I began to study more and more about the analogy of husband and wife. My friend, I remember a member of CCF who came and talked to me. He said, Peter, I never understood the seriousness of adultery until my wife discovered my sin. And I said, what do you mean? He said, after coming to Christ, because of my lifestyle, I did not overcome this sin immediately. But praise God, I'm no longer committing adultery. But one day, my wife asked me, did you have sex with this particular girl? Now, he said, I do not know how my wife asked me that question. Gentlemen, I want you to know something. Your wife has an instinct. Gentlemen, are you listening to me? Your wife has an instinct. And your wife asks you those questions. Do not lie. Be honest. Of course, this guy told the truth. Boom! Disaster. He said, Peter, I do not know how to explain this. It was hell on earth. But more than that, I saw the pain in my wife. I saw her bending over, crying. And I said, Peter, I pray to God, I will never commit adultery again. If I am going to commit adultery, I ask God to kill me. God, you kill me before I commit adultery again because I saw the pain in my wife. You know, I realize if you can only see the pain of your sin against God, I think you will sin less. Many times we don't understand pain that God is experiencing. Do you know God is an emotional being? Perfect, but he, he, he has emotions. He's not a robot. Anyway, I want you to know, unfathomable love of God means what? God loves us even if we don't deserve it. Are we clear? Now, this analogy of husband and wife is throughout the Bible. Example, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. 
I betroth you to one husband, Christ, that I may present you as pure virgin. You see the picture of the Bible? God's love, husband and wife. The same thing in the New Testament. I betroth you to Christ, that I may present you a pure virgin. Notice the danger. The danger is this. I'm afraid as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. You see, Christianity is very simple. Love God with all your heart and love one another. Simplicity and devotion to Christ. But Satan is very wise. He complicates Christianity. He will let you love other things more than your love for God. It's called, the, if you love something else more than you love God, what, what is it called? Idolatry. And idolatry in the Bible is always connected with spiritual adultery. Let me repeat. If you read the Old Testament 21 times, you will see the word adultery, adultery, idolatry, idolatry. They are always connected. Adultery, idolatry. Idolatry is spiritual adultery. That's how we treat God. So let's examine ourselves. Are there idols in your life? Yes or no? How many of you have no idols in your life? Raise your hand. I think you're, is that what you did? You come here. <laughs> My friend, the test of idols to me is very simple. You know what's the test of idols? For example, but before I tell you what to me is our idols, let me define for you what is idol. Anything that you love more than you love God, that's idol. Anything that you put your trust in, in place of God, in short, anything that takes the place of God in your life, that is called idol. Let me repeat. Anything that takes the place of God in your life is an idol. And you don't have to tell me you have idols. We all have idols. The only problem is this. Do you know them? You cannot get rid of idols until you know what are the idols. You know, Blaise Pascal had an amazing statement about idols. This is his definition. There is nothing so abominable in the eyes of God and of men as idolatry whereby men render to the creature that honor which is due only to the Creator. In short, when you, pit, when you put any created things equal to the one and only Creator, that's idolatry. And you know what shocked me? You may not be aware. Some of you have made your family your idol. Some of us have made our children our idol. Some of us have made your reputation your idol. Some of us have made comfort our idol. Your love for comfort for yourself is greater than your love for God. Think about it. So my question is this. Have you identified your idols? And that, my friend, will we only, you can only overcome your idols when you say, Lord, you love me so much, I will make you my number one love. Let me repeat. If you make God your number one love, Slowly but surely, the idols will fall away. Unfathomable love, number two, is preserving. Unfathomable love of God is persevering. I'm sorry, not preserving, persevering. God loves you not just once, not just twice. Even if you run away from Him, He will chase you. That to me is unfathomable. Why do I say that? Unfathomable. You know, I want you to think of Hosea. Look at chapter 2. You know what God told Hosea? Hosea, halika. Contend, okay? This, this, this is now the reality. Contend with your mother. Contend for she is not my wife and I am not the husband. Let her put away her harlotry, tree. Let her and her adultery from between her breasts. God told Hosea. Your wife is not just going to be unfaithful. Your wife is going to commit adultery. She will not only commit adultery, she's going to leave you. And when she leaves you, she's going to be with another man. And Hosea, I want you to know something. You don't give up on her. 
I want you to bring money to her because she is now very poor. She is now miserable. Now, guys, I want you to think of something. If you are Hosea and your wife leaves you and now she's having financial problem, what will you say? Hallelujah. Balang sa buhay mo. Yes or no? You know, God's love is persevering. You know, for us, we just cancel people. We just say, enough is enough. I don't want to be hurt anymore. I want to go through all of this. You go, go. Not God's love. God's love is this. You run away from me, I still love you. And that to me is beyond my understanding. Can you imagine Hosea knocking in the house of the guy to look for the wife? And then Hosea said, oh, the man said, who are you? And then Hosea said, I am Hosea, the wife of the girl you are living in. No, the guy is so scared. The guy thought Hosea was going to hit him. And then you know what Hosea did? Now, this is just my own imagination, okay? Hosea gave, got some money and told the guy, here, here. This money is for you to take care of my wife. My goodness, if you are the guy, what will you be saying? This guy is crazy. No, of course, that's not in the Bible. That's called my imagination. But if you don't believe what I'm saying, you look at the Bible, okay? All right, I will show you from the Bible. Let's read this together. You know, it's so amazing. Look at Hosea chapter 2. Let's read verse 6. You know, this is what God did with Israel. Behold, I will hedge up her way with thorns. I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her path. She will pursue her lovers, but she will not overtake them. She will seek them, but will not find them. Then she will say, I will go back to my first husband. It was better for me than now. You see, Gomer got into problem. And yet, you know who took care of her? Look at Hosea chapter 2, verse 5. I skip this, but I will go back. Look at Hosea chapter 2, verse 5. Everybody read this. Their mother has played the harlot. She who conceived them has acted shamefully. Look. She said, I will go after my lovers who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. That's what she thought. You know, that's what she thought. Look at the next verse. Next verse, she does not know that it was I who gave her grain, the new wine, and the oil. Can you see what the Bible is saying? This girl went thinking it was the guy who is providing for her when God is saying, and the Bible says it was who? It was the husband who provided. My friend, look at yourself. Is that how you love people? You know, for me, I have, to be, I have to admit, some people, when they get out of your life, what do you say? Many of you are D group leaders. Am I correct? Some D group members will leave your D group, and what do you say? Lord, thank you. Thank you. I don't have to put up with this girl or with this person. You know, God is different. You run away from Him, I still love you. So, what is God's love? God's love is persevering. God persevere. Can I read you one more verse to show you? Look at chapter 2, verse 19. God told Hosea, this is what's going to happen. I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness, justice, loving kindness, and compassion. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness. Then you will know the Lord. When you run away from God, you will suffer consequences. When God runs after you, it does not mean He will not do things to wake you up. When God runs after you, many times He will allow pain. He will allow disappointment. Remember this famous quotation by C.S. Lewis? Pain is the megaphone of God to wake us up. Pleasure 
is when God whispers. You see, when you're having a good time, you don't listen. But when you're in pain, you listen. And I'm going to tell you right now, some of you are in pain. Some of you are having problems. It is not because God does not love you. But God is trying to tell you something. The only question is, are you listening? My friend, you must always re remember, God loves you. His love is what? Undeserved. And number two, what is God's unfathomable love? He perseveres. But persevering does not always mean there's no problem. God uses problems, financial problems, health problems, relationship problems, all kinds of problems to wake us up. And some of you have been running away from God. And God is saying, I love you. God's love is persevering. And then, the next thing I want you to know is God's love is redemptive. What do we mean by redemptive? You know, people don't realize that God's love is based on His righteousness and justice. God loves you as you are. But because He loves you as you are, He will not allow you to remain as you are. So God will do something to transform you. That's why God's love is redemptive. You know what happened to Gomer? By the way, if you have a daughter, please don't name her Gomer, okay? But uh, do you want to know what happened to Gomer? Gomer sunk so low. Her life became so miserable that her boyfriend decided to sell her as a slave. Once upon a time, Gomer was a wife, taken care of by Hosea. She became unfaithful. She not only became unfaithful, she left the husband, stayed in with a man, thinking that the man would take care of her. But the man could not take care of her. It was the husband. And then she sank so low that she was sold as a slave. She's now a slave. And she's for sale. Now, if you were Hosea, what will you do? <laughs> Some of you will say, Sabi ko nang ay. You will tell all your friends, you see? That's what you get for leaving me. Yes or no? Unfathomable. You know what God told, go what God told Hosea? Hosea, come. I want you to do the following. Are you ready for the shock? All right. Here is the shocking truth. Chapter 3, verse 1. The Lord said to me, Go again. Love a woman who is loved by her husband, and yet an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the sons of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love raising cakes. Raising cakes is used to worship, offering other gods. But God is saying, you love this woman. And what must you do to her? Well, the Bible tells us, verse 2, I want you to do the following. I want you to buy her. I want you to buy her. I bought her for myself. 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a half of barley. The word homer and a half of barley is equal to 15 shekels in terms of monetary value. In short, the price of Gomer became so cheap. 30 shekels. Does the word 30 shekels remind you of something? Yes, Judas. Judas. Jesus was betrayed. 30 shekels. My friend, Gomer sunk so low. And Hosea bought her back. Now, what happened when he bought her back? You know what he said? You shall stay with me for many days, you shall not play the harlot, nor shall you have a man. I will also be toward you. You know what Hosea said? You will be my wife again. You know, Hosea could have said, I'm going to buy you, but now you're my slave. You're mine. No, no. I buy you. You stay with me. I'll be your husband. Friends, what kind of love is that? What kind? See, God's love is 
not just persevering, it is redemptive. Think about it. Can you love like Homer? You know, humanly speaking, can you love like Hosea? I realize I cannot. But because of Christ, I've seen people love like Hosea. I know of a guy who came to me midnight. He said, Peter, my wife is committing adultery. What do I do? I said, what do you want to do? You want to leave her? You want, what do you want to do? You see, when I counsel people, I ask them, what do you want to do? You know, I was so touched. He said, this is at midnight, huh? midnight. He said, Peter, I love my wife. I will not leave her. I will continue loving her. You know, I cried. Here is a man who loves his wife, even though the wife is committing adultery, present tense. Wow. I said, okay, let's invite her to a retreat, couples retreat. In the couples retreat, my wife and I made sure she's in our group. So we counseled her. Then I discovered something. I saw the hardness of her heart. She's hard. So I said, are you going to give up on the guy? You know what she told me? You know what she told us? I'm still thinking about it. Now, if you're the husband, and you heard your wife say, I was still thinking about it, gentlemen, how would you feel? Echa puera na. In English, echa puera. Good rhythms. Good luck. You know, what hit me was because the husband experienced the love of God. He's able to love her. Today, if you see them, you'll be shocked. You will not know what they went through. And they've been living together for the last 20 years. Is God good or not? Amazing. The advantage of CCF, we have history. We know people. And we have observed them. By the way, we are going to celebrate our 40th anniversary. Amen? It is coming August. But one of the blessings that we have as many of our pastors, like Pastor Jim, we have seen how people are transformed by following Jesus. And we have seen, if you don't follow Jesus, disaster. You repent, you follow Jesus, restoration. And that is what happened to Gomer. She was restored. Do you notice something? The Bible does not tell us what happened to Gomer after this. You read the Bible. You will not know what happened to Gomer. You want me to tell you what happened? You like me to tell you why the Bible did not say what happened? Okay, I'll tell you later. Remind me as we close, okay, as we close. You know, the Bible tells us the problem of many people, Christians, including the Israelites, is exactly what God concluded in Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. The Bible tells us, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. You know, many Christians are destroyed because they don't study the Bible. You don't know God. You don't know His love. You don't know His commandments. And you are deceived by the devil. Many of us, if I were to ask you one more time, I'm almost sure you will raise your hands. How many of you believe the Bible is the Word of God? Raise your hands. See? How many of you have read the whole Bible? Raise your hand. That's the problem. You tell me you believe the Bible is the Word of God. So I ask you, have you read the whole Bible? Many of you have not read. What is the problem? It's called the deception of the human mind. The human mind is the only species in the planet Earth that can deceive itself. You believe something, you don't do it. And I'm telling you now, don't deceive yourself. You believe God loves you. You believe the Bible is God's word. If I were you, I'm going to read it. I want to know God. I want to know His love. I want to know His commandments. But I cannot force you. So, the Bible tells us, you need to know in Hosea 11, God repeats what happened. Okay? God is saying, when Israel was a, was a youth, I loved him. Out of Egypt, I called my son. Now the analogy of father and son. The love 
of parents. The more they called them, the more they went from them. It is God's prophet, prophets telling Israel, repent, repent, repent. But the more they went from them, the more they ran away from the prophets. They kept sacrificing to the Baals, burning incense. It is I who taught Ephraim to walk. Ephraim stands for Israel, one of the biggest tribes. I took them in my arms, but they did not know I healed them. Ignorance. Many times you don't see God's hand in your life. My friend, learn to see God at work in your life, including problems. Can you see God in your life? Yes or no? Learn to see God. God is saying, I love you. And you know what? Look at the heart of God. Hosea 11, 8. This is the heart of God. God says, how can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I surrender you, O Israel? This is God expressing his pain. How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Seboim? Adma and Seboim are the cities surrounding Sodom and Gomorrah. These are connected. They were all destroyed. God is saying, how can I destroy you? My heart is turned over within my heart. Notice, his heart is turned over within me. All my compassion, all my internal organs are kindled. God is saying, I love you guys so much. How can I give you up? God's love is unfathomable. You know why? In spite of our sinfulness, our, his love is undeserved. His love is persevering. He's running after you. And his love is redemptive. But he will do something to cause you to change. Yes or no? Look at many of you. Why are you here this morning? I know many of you have been touched by God. And you know, the reason why they have a problem, this, this is something that they need to know. This is their problem. In Hosea 13, verse 6. Let's read fast together, okay? 13, verse 6. As they had their pasture, they became satisfied. And being satisfied, their heart became proud. Therefore, they forgot me. You know how people forget God? When everything's going well. That's how you forget God. And God is saying, please, don't do that. I love you. And you know, this is what God wants. In Hosea 14, verse 1 and 2, God is saying, Return, O Israel, the Lord your God. You have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take words with you and return to the Lord and say to him, Take away all iniquity, receive us graciously, that we may present the fruit of our lips. That word, return, has the idea of repent. This word is repeated over 20 times in the book of Hosea. The message of Hosea is this, I love you, you have worshipped other gods, and disaster awaits you. You need to repent. Repent, repent, return to me. And how do you return? Take words with you and return, repent, and say the following things. Number one, to repent means what? Admit you're a sinner. Take away all our iniquity. You must admit your sin. You must be willing to get rid of sin. There is no restoration without repentance. So God says, you must repent. Take away our sins. And number two, you must be willing to accept God's forgiveness, God's grace. So that you can do number three. What is number three? That we may present the fruit of our lips so that you can worship me and you can give thanks to me. You cannot give thanks to God until you repent, until you experience His grace. That is repentance. Today, I'm happy to share with you, we have an amazing testimony from our sister, Mitzi. Mitzi, please come, share your story. How God's love transformed your life. Many of you may know Mitzi. Mitzi used to be a movie star, but she will explain her story, please. Uh, blessed morning to all of you, everyone. I'm Sharon Michelle Di Maglipon. Growing up, I was a happy child who always dreamed of becoming a famous celebrity and a mom. I had a happy childhood, but I also had a difficult upbringing. 
I grew up in a very dysfunctional household. My dad had two wives. He would always stay with his other wife every other day and bring her family to gatherings and important holidays. As a result, there would always be loud arguments, screaming, rage, swearing, and violence in our home. Seeing my parents constantly hurting each other had a profound emotional impact on me. I felt lost and confused. I started modeling at the age of 12. My parents supported me, but I was vulnerable and rebellious. So I was disobedient to them at that time. Without their knowledge, I joined a bikini open at 24. And since I was already earning for myself, I developed vices like partying, smoking, and drinking. At 18, I was exposed to porn. I ran away from home twice because I felt I need to be away from my chaotic family. I lived the life I thought was best for me. Finally, I felt free. I work hard as a bikini and lingerie model. So even though I didn't do drugs, I did smoke marijuana because that's when we were given before any event started. I became a sexy star, appeared in sensual movies, posed for men's magazines, and competed in an international bikini fashion show. I enjoyed the lifestyle that came with my career. The attention I get from men and even multiple sexual encounters and one night stands I have with strangers. I felt I was on top of everything. Money, men, fame. I felt my dreams were coming true, but things changed when I got pregnant with my boyfriend. My dreams of modeling and acting were halted. Despite having a family of my own, my sexual immoral lifestyle continued until I became pregnant with my third child. I felt this deep sense of longing as if there was a hole inside me. I attempted suicide, multiple times because I felt hopeless and weak, dirty and worthless. The things I hated most in my family growing up became the things I'm doing in my own family. Anger, violence, sexual immorality. I got tired of living the life I thought I wanted. I sensed that something was wrong with me. I wasn't at peace and I had the need to make a change. I bought self-help books, but still I didn't find any answers, so I earnestly cried to God. It was around the time that I came across with a Christian influencer on social media. Her joyful post made me envious and curious, which is how I found out about CCF via Google search. I called their pastoral care for counseling in an attempt to get assistance. I had never before interacted with a Christian who prayed for me until this point. God also led me to WOW Women to Women Thursdays, where I met my first spiritual family. Slowly but surely, God started to move in my life in 2016. I joined a true life retreat where I understood the greatness of God's love for me. And out of his love for me, he convicted me of my sinful lifestyle. In response to God's love, I surrendered my life to him knowing he alone can change me. Because I have learned that my body is God's temple, I repented and confessed of every ungodly thing I did to my body. Praise the Lord. The Lord gave me victory over pornography, masturbation, and lustful thoughts. God also moved my partner and get married after 12 years of living together. When we learn the importance of embracing God's design for marriage, by God's grace, I, ex I experience acceptance and forgiveness from my husband for the ungodly things I've done. By God's grace, God also moved in the life of my parents. My dad passed away in 2019. He, accept, he accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior before his passing. As for my mom, 
She is also a follower of Christ now and is developing a deeper relationship with the Lord. Praise God. I praise God for how He pursued me and redeemed me from my broken past despite my stubbornness. It was His love that compelled me to turn away from my sinful and pursue the life that pleases me today. Today, I can confidently say that I am living the best life because God is the one leading my life. To God be the glory. Praise God. Uh, Mitch, praise God for your testimony. I want to invite your family here, the husband and the children. You know, God is amazing how He is redemptive. Amen? He can transform people. And I'm asking your D group leader, Noreen. Where are you? Noreen, please come. Please come uh, closer here. Mitch, come, come closer. Everybody, I want you to raise your right hand. Let us pray for this couple. Some of you may think that you have sunk so low that God is rejecting you or that God no longer loves you. Can I tell you something? God's love is amazing. Yes or no? He does not give up on us. He perseveres and He restores. Amen? But you need repentance. Without repentance, there is no restoration. I praise God for your story, for your testimony. And Noreen, uh, you all know what happened to Noreen, right? Her husband just recently passed away. But her joy her demeanor. I really praise God for our members. Is God amazing? Yes or no? So let us now pray. Father God, I thank you for this family. I thank you for transforming the life of our sister. I thank you for Mitch, how you have transformed her, and for Jim, how you have used him also to be the man to take care of this family. I pray for this couple that you will continue to use them, expand their borders, and I thank you for Noreen, that how you have allowed her to disciple many other women, and especially this family. I now pray for their future, that you'll always bring glory, honor to your name, and bless this family, protect this family. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen and amen. God bless. God bless. Friends, this is reality. We are like Gomer. In that story, I am like Gomer. Even though God loves me many times, I'm not faithful to God. In this story, I want you to know, God loves you. God's love is undeserved. Don't try to impress people. Don't try to impress God. Be honest with Him. God knows everything about you. Admit our mistakes, our sinfulness. Number two, God's love is persevering. He will not give up on you. Therefore, don't be surprised when you experience spiritual discipline. The Bible says, whom the Lord loves, He will discipline. And God disciplines us in many ways. But it is not comfortable. Because God will sacrifice your physical comfort for the sake of your spiritual good. Amen? And lastly, God's love is always redemptive. You know, someday, you read Revelation chapter 19, 7 and 8. This is what will happen. The Bible tells us the picture of marriage is in the Bible. Even at the end times, there will be a marriage of Jesus and us. Jesus is the bridegroom. We are the bride. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to Him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready. The Bible describes the church of God, the people of God, as the bride. God expects us to be pure, to be holy. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. My friend, my prayer is you will take this message seriously. That God loves you. 
because He loves you unconditionally, you need to respond in love. As we close, I'd like you to know that my wife Diana is attending a wake service for her brother. Her brother just passed away two, three days ago. Marvin is a very good man. I know him. He's a pastor. But when he passed away, my wife told me, people stood up, they lined up, and they said things about him for four hours. Why? Because Marvin lived out God's love. Marvin not just loved the church. He loved the community. He would help people inside the church, outside the church. But one thing they all said about Marvin, he loves God and he loves people. Because Marvin's life, my brother-in-law, is an example of somebody who understood the unfathomable love of God. Therefore, his life is amazing. He touched so many people. And why do I find memory of Marvin? Last year, we were visiting him. He was healthy. He was strong. I realized something about life. It's short. If you live, I suggest you live a life without regret. My brother-in-law is now in the presence of God, dressed in white linen. My friend, I don't know where you are spiritually today. But some of you have been running away from God. Some of you are like Gomer. I want you to repent today and return. Some of you have friends that has hurt you. You have been in pain. And you have protected yourself. You are no longer pursuing people. You know why? Because you have withdrawn from people because you want to protect yourself. God's love is not to withdraw from people. And I understand why some of you are withdrawing from people. You have been hurt. You have been betrayed. And by withdrawing from people, you protect yourself. But can I tell you something? If you withdraw from people, your heart becomes hard. And someday, you will be very hard. God's plan is for us to love like Hosea. You know why you don't know what happened to Gomer? You want me to tell you now? Why, did, why was the Bible silent? Because if the Bible says Gomer finally stayed with him forever, and then you'll be thinking, if I show love to people, people should come back and change properly. But that's not always the case. If the Bible tells us Gomer did not come back, did not behave well, then you will say, it's useless. Why should I love like Hosea when it's going to be useless? So the Bible is silent. You know why the Bible is silent? Because it is not your responsibility to know what happens to Gomer. It is your responsibility to love like Hosea. The Gomers in your life is God's responsibility. What you should do is love like Hosea, pursuing, undeserved, and redemptive. What happened to others, that is God's department. And lastly, whether you like it or not, you are like Gomer, always running away from God. And if God speaks to you today, I want you to repent. Let's bow our heads and pray. If God has spoken to you, and you want to repent and return to the Lord, I want to pray for you. Raise your hands. Praise God. Anybody else? God has spoken to you, and you know something's not right and you want to return, raise your hands higher. I want to pray for you. Keep them up high. Lord Jesus, I pray for my brothers and sisters who is raising their hand. You have asked them to repent. You have asked them to return. Lord, as they acknowledge their sin, whatever is your sin in your heart right now, you confess them directly to Jesus right now, wherever you are. Say, Lord, I've sinned against you, whatever it is. You have idols in your heart. You have idols in your life. 
Lord Jesus, look down from heaven. We accept your amazing love and we deserve pursuing redemptive. Remind us, you will always love us. Remind us, it's never too late to repent. It is never too late to change because your love is always there for us. Thank you, Jesus. As your hands are raised up, wherever you are right now, I want you to quietly stand up. Quietly stand up wherever you are. Those of you who raise your hands, wherever you are, stand up. Don't, no, don't look around. Make this day a special day. Why do I want you to stand up? I'd like you to remember this day that you are receiving God's unconditional love. You are receiving God's unconditional forgiveness. And above all, you believe that God's best plan is yet to come. Lord Jesus, I pray for this group of men and women, thousands of them, Lord, as they stood up, you really want to assure them it's never too late to change, but Lord, you love them. Assure them of your love and help them and help me to love others like Hosea. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Everybody stand up. As you stand up, next week, I want you to bring your friends. I'm going to give another message on the Old Testament on how to love God in return. How do you love God in return? Are you interested in that? But today there's a song I asked them to practice last night. Thank you for practicing last night. Let's praise this group. You know why? It's a song that I felt is very good for you to learn. Shall we close with this song? All right. Take it away. Okay. Let's respond to God's message through this song. guest today we want to welcome you to our welcome center right outside the worship hall and you want to get to know you more and we encourage you to be part of a discipleship group where we can grow in faith through fellowship the d group booth is also at the second floor lobby part of our worship is giving if god prompts you to give tithe boxes can be found around the sanctuary or you can visit ccf.org.ph give have, have a, a blessed, blessed sunday, sunday. everybody